I said to the guy, I said, you're looking for precursors of the summer of love. Um, I was there. I, I came to Berkeley in 1964 and was there through 67. I said the precursors were um, were not something that the kids necessarily knew about. The youth didn't know about. They weren't reading history and thinking about history. But if you listen to the you listen to the dialogue, you listen to people talk. It's not it's not Kerouac and it's not Ginsburg, because Kerouac and Ginsburg didn't have any idea what the hell was going on. They thought hippies were just and and political radicals were out of their mind. You go back and you listen to these talks upstairs, and you find out it's Whitman. It's Whitman. Whitman understood the whole thing, that a radical cultural revolution is going to have to remake the nation after it's created an industrial, a powerhouse in industrial system that will bring the goods and abundance for everyone, and a democratic system that will give political rights to everyone. We still haven't achieved the kind of psychological, psychosocial revolution that we need. And that, Whitman said, is going to come in the future. And what the various countercultures in American history. The first one is 1900, 1915 in the village and in the East Coast, a little bit in Carmel and places like that. And then it emerges in the 60s, beginning in California, but spreading throughout the country. And this was what Whitman said was going to happen. New kinds of communities, new kinds of relationships, new kinds of individuals. And so there's a continuity through all this. I mean, we tend to see things as broken up. We see things as broken up because that way we don't have to deal with them. If, if it's a small event that's in response to the war, people say, well, the counterculture happened because of the war. The counterculture was there for three or four years before the war was even an issue. But if they can relate, relate it to the war, then it's local, it's temporary, it's transitory, and we can get, we can get past it. But if you say Whitman, then you got a problem, right? You got, the, you got to deal with it because it's there and it's con it's continuing and it's evolving and it's growing from the 1900 1915 when a few tens of thousands of people did it to millions in the 60s then you've got something that historically becomes like the early democratic movements in the 16th century they start small small protests small political events and gradually become the basis of a kind of modern democratic nation so there's a continuity here and that's what I'm trying to to, to, to help people understand. But, but let me offer one other point in terms of the, the, the longevity of the counterculture and, and its importance in history, which I think I was just talking upstairs with uh, one of the fellows who runs the Center for Counterculture Studies. And that has to do with the counterculture's rethinking in a, in a massive historical way. I mean, a massive historical way about the uh, about the role of authority in culture and society. I mean, it's one of the great events, in, I think, in history, and we haven't begun to deal with it yet. If you, start, if you look at liberalism, Western liberalism, that starts in the 17th century, Hobbes, Locke, the beginning of capitalism, they basically knocked out the kinds of traditional authority systems, monarch, aristocracy, right, uh, established church, all of these institutions, uh, feudal system. Liberalism knocked that out. And, and basically did away with that kind of authority that's kind of divine and based on, the, uh, on uh, a kind of cosmo, a kind of theoretical understanding that, that authority exists in human affairs. Liberalism said we're going to get rid of all that. And it said we're going to replace it with instrumental relationships, the authority of the boss, the authority of the parent. These are not religious and sacred. They're just relationships we need to get along with each other. We need authority. Okay? And the result of that was the United States, where there's no divine authority, there's no established church, there's no monarch, there's no aristocracy. No divine authority. It's all gone, right? It's all gone. I mean, the, so what the counterculture said was even these modern authority systems that liberalism created in the 17th, 18th century, those are no longer valid. Father, mother, that's patriarchy. Kids have a right to be human beings. Bosses don't have a right to tell employees what to do. We need democratic workplaces. P 
po po political leaders don't tell us what to do. They're our representatives. We need a dem democratization of institutions. Across the board, authority was, was challenged and the idea of these authorities in liberal society was defeated. Now, what, what happened? And that, was the, and that was the 60s that did that. But now what? There's no authority left, right? There's no concept of authority. Hannah Arendt talks about this. A lot of theorists talk about the elimination of kind of authority as a concept in the modern world. But where does that leave us? It leaves us with a real problem, which is we don't know how to relate to each other. Because if you're on top of me or I'm, in, you know, you're telling me what to do or I'm telling you what to do, we know what to do. But if we have to talk together and work out relationships together, now what? It's going to take 60, 60 years to figure out what to do. Think of, think of intimate relationships today. No patriarchy. Who's in charge? Who makes the decisions? What if the kids are part of the system? How do we make decisions? So the counterculture opened up these vast questions about how we live together, work together, play together, create together, produce things together, engage in religious experiences together, um, make decisions in politics together. How do we do all that without an authority system? And so we've, the counterculture has left American society in a com I mean, completely upside down. And now, in the, in the short and medium run, of course, that leads to people saying, I can't live without authority. I need someone to tell me what to do. And it leads to Trumpism, mm -hmm. right? I but need Trump, to know where to stand. I need to know. Fall in, line, I don't even, in fact, I don't even know what place? he says, as long as he tells me what to do, yeah. right? Yeah. So he's kind of the extreme caricature of a guy who doesn't know what he's thinking, but he'll tell anybody what to do. So it's a kind, but that's not where we're headed. That's a reaction to this kind of anxiety we all feel about how do we live together? Are we gonna figure out every day who's going shopping? Who's gonna do the dishes? Who's gonna nurture the, uh, the child? Who's gonna work and who's gonna play? Yeah. Are we gonna every day have to meet and talk about what to do? Yeah. It used to be easy, right? So you're saying the counterculture presented that new challenge. Absolutely. Right. In every way. Non-defined roles non -defined. and hierarchy and Look at this. Yeah. Look at this. Gay, transgender, right? It's no longer, you know, LB, LGBTQ. You know, it's now like there's 30 letters, right? You know, and we want to respect and embrace it and acknowledge it and validate everyone, of course. But it gets a little tricky, cumbersome. Yes, cumbersome. Another way of putting cumbersome is to say challenging. Namely, we're going to learn how to live together in ways that nobody has ever learned to live together before. What a cause. Isn't that great? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's what life is about. Yeah. Negotiating our lives every day. Yeah. That's what freedom is. And that's it's awesome. always evolving and changing, so it's adaptation and adjustment anyway. That's right. But Realizing. that's freedom. That's yes. real freedom, yeah. which America promised and never gave. It's real freedom because every day, we decide who we're going to be and how we're going to do it. It's kind of it's kind of a beautiful thing. It's what great great art comes out of. I mean, sitting before a page and deciding what to write, or a music score, or sitting with an instrument. I mean, we all become creative and creators of the kinds of lives we want to live. So that's the counterculture. Mm -hmm. So it's not like our hippies alive and well. Do we still see titles? It's no, no matter how you want to look at it there is a resonating impact and influence today clearly and it's embedded in the fabric of our culture and our society yes. whether and we it, like it or acknowledge yes, it or not yes and what trump is doing is people have made this kind of devil's bargain with trump that as long as trump and this kind of right-wing conservatism that started with reagan as long as that's around none of us will have to discover our inner hippie but it's not going to be it can't it, they can't close it down forever. Ultimately, we're going to have to discover our inner hippies. Yeah, because it's connectedness and it's recognizing our, our inherent connection to all that is and our brotherhood with everyone on earth. And our relation yeah. to the earth, yeah. our relationship to traditions yeah. like Native Americans. I mean, it's inclusive. Eastern philosophies. It's cetera. inclusive. Yeah. It's inclusive. Once you real, recognize your inner hippie means we're all in it. Right? We're all in it together. together. Together, let's with Ann Cohen. Let's work together. Yes. So the <laughs> not to mention canned heat. Yes. So the notion that somehow this has dissipated. I mean, there are now thousands of intentional communities in the country, and they're growing all the time. 
there are people tr tr creating new work kinds of workplaces. You know in intimate relations, people are creating things all the time. Trial and error, right? A lot of failure, a lot of experiment, a lot of trying. We're trying to get it right. We're trying to raise kids the right way where they feel empowered. And But so people are in part embracing that slowly, but they're also running from it because they don't have any answers. So we have to help people. The next phase, of, it seems to be, of all this is to try and help people calm down and say, we're going to be provisional about this. We're going to find processes that work. It may not provide answers. The answers may shift from day to day. But we're going to find processes where we can learn to live with each other, solve our conflicts, resolve our, our tensions, but but be affirmative about the process. In a way, it sounds like that dream of utopia, but a practical utopia and a yes. realistic dream. Yes. <laughs> you want to know something? Yeah. My students, and I mean, I'm 70 years old now. My students, who I've taught for 40 years, would say, you guys in the 60s, summer of love, had incredible dreams. You didn't have the faintest idea what to do with it. Not the faintest idea. You had, you couldn't take one step in the support of those ideas. Now they're wrong, some people tried things, but a lot of the communes and other things, new kinds of businesses failed. But a lot of my students say, yes, we want what you wanted, but we want to, we want to get it right. Because you, you, could, you could fall back on corporate jobs, university jobs, maybe trust funds, maybe this, maybe that. We got nothing. So we got to make it work. So we're committed to making it work. If we create a new kind of business or a new kind of community or a new kind of relationship, we want to find the ways to make it work. It's healthy, right? It's the next stage. Practical utopia. Unity. Practical. Mutual nurturing. Yes, but practical. <laughs> yes. Practical, and I think that's the next stage of the counterculture. It's, I mean, it's gonna, It's great. Look, I went to hear the Grateful Dead in the park and Country Joe and Airplane. Yeah, <laughs> Ever, I mean, it's great to get high with this kind of headiness of the culture and all that. It's great. But in the end, you got day to day, you got to yeah, live. You got tomorrow. You got to live. Yeah. You got to live. You got to live the dream you're going to have. Yeah. So I think this, I think the counterculture, talking to you and talking upstairs, it's more alive than it ever, Thank than you. ever. Thank you. I, I think we're a wrap. But we always love to wrap with a hug. High five and a hug. <laughs>